Welcome to Spotlight on Healthy Kingston, the year in review. My name is Janet Wade, and as a member of the Board of Health, I've been honored to host this program these past 12 months. We've covered a lot of informative and interesting topics, from ticks to organ donation to spirituality, marijuana use, the dangers associated with vaping, and the work of Moms Demand Action Against Gun Violence. And that's just to name a few. We decided that much of the information remains relevant and is important, so it's been abbreviated and compiled into this one hour long program. Ticks are constantly an issue in our community. Blake Dinius, an entomologist with the Plymouth County Extension Service, discusses the types, how they can affect us, and how to prevent exposure. So a lot of people think maybe it's just occurring over the summer, but in terms of uh, when we think of the risk of tick-borne disease, now that's a year-round problem. You've got, the, some, you've got the deer tick here, the tick that most people are concerned about, the, you know, the one that transmits Lyme disease, that's what I usually say. This tick is going to be active in the summer months as the nymph stage tick and also the larval stage tick. But when we get into the October month, from October right around until about really the end of April, early May, what you have active is known as the adult stage of this tick. And this tick is going to be seeking out the blood of a large mammal at this time, mainly deer, but sometimes us. <clears throat> wow. Um, what are some differences between this time of the year and the summer months as far as ticks go? Another, another great question. So when the, the major concern with this particular stage of tick, the adult stage, is that it's it's about 50% infected with the agent that causes Lyme disease. Unlike the nymph stage tick, which is infected about 25% of the time. Now mm -hmm. the good news is that this particular tick is much easier to see, but the, the tick can also be brought in around this time to unsuspecting victims. Like if, for instance, if you had been lounging on your couch all day long, but you let your dog Sparky outside and your dog Sparky goes and plays outside, mm -hmm. now your dog can come inside and you may not be aware of this new tick that, not necessarily a new tick, but a different life stage of tick that is now higher infected with Lyme and because you're unaware of it, now you're at, you're at a greater risk for getting Lyme disease. Huh. And this tick, the other thing to know about this particular tick is that it's found it's found much higher up off the ground than the than the tick than the uh, the nymph stage tick, which occurs during the summer months. This tick can be found as high as two and a half feet off the ground. So that's something you want to be aware of when you're going out th for a walk in the woods. For instance, we might have a for a nice October day or a nice November day where the temperatures get into maybe the 50s or 60s. People might want to wear shorts or they might want to wear shorter, not, not long pants. Yeah. And now they've just exposed their calves and everything from two and a half feet down. You've got to think that's about waist height down to, to potentially getting ticks to attach to them as well. What about in freezing weather, like below 32 degrees? It's below 32 degrees, this tick is going to become not necessarily dormant, but it'll become less active. It really, when you get any temperature above 32 degrees, that's when this tick becomes active. Now, the other two ticks that we have in this area, the American dog tick and the Lone Star tick, those are two other ticks that can bite humans. Those ticks, they kind of go into like a sleeping mode during the winter season, but the deer tick, it's a different kind of tick. And this tick, it, it's active at any time temperatures get above freezing. So you have picaridin, oil of lemon eucalyptus, and IR-3535. And that last one, that IR-3535, that's also known as Avon Skin So Soft with Bug Guard. So if you know huh. an Avon representative, you can get the IR-3535. Now something else to note about these repellents is that for the DEET, the picaridin, and the Avon Skin So Soft with Bug Guard, you want about 20% or more. You don't need more than 20%, 20% that'll do it. But if you decide to go with the oil of lemon eucalyptus, you want 30% active ingredient or more. So the oil of lemon eucalyptus requires a little bit more, but you'll get the same repellency as DEET if you wanted to use that. The, le the second thing you can do, and this is really kind of like our silver bullet against ticks, is that you can treat your clothing with, with a product called permethrin, or permethrin, tomato, tomato. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter as long as you use it. Barbara Ward is a licensed therapist, a yoga instructor, and founder of the Yoga Connection in Plymouth. In this sometimes chaotic and uncertain world, Barbara discusses practicing and reflecting on our spirituality so as to offer us balance, stability, and hopefully peace. Well, for me, it's just about an attitude and a concern for spreading loving kindness, compassion, understanding, and forgiveness in the world. But it has to start with ourselves. 
So that's why personal practices like yoga and meditation help to cultivate that idea of feeling good about yourself. And the better we feel about ourselves, the more connected we become with sharing those intrinsic values that I think you could sum up by, like the Dalai Lama says, it's love. It's about feeling love. And you can't feel love for other people if you don't feel for yourself. And you probably have heard me say that more than a thousand times. times. But it's the idea of with those traits, with those that sensibility that we kind of get rid of the sense of the other and we develop a sense of oneness. And in today's world where we're so fragmented and we're being pulled in so many directions to just stay focused on loving kindness, compassion, understanding, and forgiveness for ourselves, but definitely forgiveness for others. Other people. Well, I, uh, just from what you're saying, I can certainly pick up on how this could affect one's health, but I'd like to hear from you. Uh, how you feel this, this attitude and this mindset can affect your, your physical and your emotional health? Well, the, the whole sense of uh, mindfulness, yoga, which are all the same thing really, is the idea that we're connected mind, body, and spirit. All right, and spirit can be another word for soul. Or spirit can be just, when we say someone has great spirit, we're talking about energy. So if we can adapt to those attitudes of kindness and compassion and understanding, um, those are healthy things. And when we practice those, those feelings and sharing them, it has to have a positive effect on the trillions of cells we have in our bodies because everything we think or do or say, we internalize. It's the food that keeps us going. I think that the practices that I'm most involved in are not going to cure anybody, but there's a difference between curing and healing. healing right. And healing, I feel like, uh, Loving kindness, being a spiritual person is like being, um, being able to touch someone with love just with your hand. Even touching mm -hmm. someone is healing. And the thoughts that we could offer or prayers, and prayers don't necessarily have to be to a deity because spirituality does not necessarily involve a god or gods right. any more than religion doesn't always include spirituality. Right. So this is not, this has nothing to do with organized religion no, whatsoever. No, there's no dogma. There's no hierarchy. Uh, we, most of us are spiritual people. Some of us don't know it, but most people who are kind and take good care of themselves are the kind of people that share that with other people. people. And it's like a salve that you put on a wound, that doesn't mean it's going to heal it, but it makes makes it feel better. It yeah. alleviates some of the suffering. Absolutely. I mean, I I've, I hear this over and over and over again at the yoga classes I've taken over the years, and I felt it myself. You walking away feeling de-stressed, relaxed, um, capable, able to go on. Um, it puts you in a wonderful place. Also, I, I, I feel emotionally, also physically, it has done a lot for my balance, um, for my muscle strength. Uh, I imagine, can you speak to these two things? Well, but that's the practice, the physical practice, but I'm always stressing that you can't work with the body if you're not working with your mind and the spirit too. Mm -hmm. And then to me, the ultimate spirit is the fact that the word spirit in many languages is the same word for breath. And the bottom line is it is breath, the spirit, life force that keeps us together, keeps us connected. So with that in mind, can you give us well, you, you talked about breath, and I, uh, I know you've mentioned to me that that's very important. Right. So how can we practice our spirituality? Well, actually, in my uh, psychotherapy practice, I usually give people a rubber band to put on their wrist. Hmm. And 
when they feel detached or stressed, I have them just snap the rubber band against their wrist and wake up and stop. And it's scientifically proven that even just stopping for three conscious breaths, in other words, you don't even have to close your eyes. You just have to stop. You have to breathe in. Can you demonstrate for all of us? <laughs> well, you can close your eyes if you want to. OK. All right, so you know you're breathing right now. Just feel your breath. Mm -hmm. And now just breathe in as completely as you can without effort, and then just breathe out slowly. And there's no right or wrong here. So whenever you're ready, just breathe in your second breath. And breathe out as slowly as you can because of the parts of the breath, the exhalation is the most important thing. And every time you breathe in again, you're starting your life again because your breath is your life force. So breathe in and breathe out. And generally, just in those three breaths, everybody kind of settles down. And we feel a little more relaxed. In I yoga, certainly do. In yoga, we call that prana. So mm -hmm. the, it's, you're taking in the energy surrounding you and from other people. But we share our breath. And whether we're in the yoga class or not, Every time you breathe, someone else is breathing in that breath. So again, to me, the whole spiritual thing is getting away from the sense of other and realizing the oneness. And breath actually kind of illuminates us from the inside out. Mm -hmm. And I always talk about honoring the light inside, inside. ourselves. Mm -hmm. Because until you can feel your own light, you can never really recognize it in other people. And I think I gave you a quote. Now, I hope people know that Buddhism is not a religion, it's a philosophy, that Buddha said, light your own lamp, and the lives of others will be illuminated effortlessly. I love that. That's certainly a perfect way to end. Yes, and to look at everyone, ourselves and everyone else, as light bearers. Yes. Plymouth Area Coalition for the Homeless is located in Kingston, and it shelters 13 families, covering 22 communities on the South Shore. Sue Giovanetti, the executive director, discusses its mission to treat residents with compassion and dignity, and through a variety of programs such as case management, counseling, seeking employment, and health education, empowers them to progress towards stable, fulfilling lives. So uh, the the Plymouth Area Coalition is really uh, a series of programs, but at the heart and core of what we do is uh, the staff of the Plymouth Area Coalition um, is extremely dedicated to uh, uh, works of social justice and compassion to those, toward those individuals who need uh, added support with basic needs. That could be shelter, food, um, what we do is uh, run a program that focuses around education, uh, helping families um, and, and individuals, but families specifically at the shelter, uh, to um, get themselves together, get back on their feet. We provide various educational classes, um, help them in rehousing searches and employment search, and build up their family strength so that they then can go on to uh, live independently of the shelter and find permanent housing. So you're empowering them. You're not taking Absolutely. care of them. It's all about empowerment. Uh, we've actually rededicated the education program and uh, really refer to it as empower empowerment with the little arrow toward the ME. Um, it all has to start with us in individuals Individually, um, no matter who we are, uh, it has to be our decision. We have to feel good about ourselves, and that's what we want to do for our clients. And speaking of the clients, can you mm -hmm. just kind of give us an overview of the clients that you do have? Absolutely. So um, while it's true that a large number of families that enter a shelter uh, tend to be single women head of households with children, we actually have, ex have been experiencing a shift of uh, 
families with two adults in the family. I would say I'd say probably about forty percent of our um, really our families at this time are two parent households. Um, that said, uh, we generally average around 50, 53 um, individuals in shelter at any given time, and with an average of about 32 children. As we grow older, falls can become more of a reality. Jack Breen, a physical therapist and a member of the Kingston Board of Health, discusses fall prevention. Well, we all see falls on TV or other, but I would say, and it's, it's, it's not getting down in the weeds, that almost any time you lose balance, and, and we go throughout the day, think we may trip, think we may lose our balance. So, you know, a, a fall is really losing your balance. You don't have to break a wrist or dislocate a shoulder. You know, it's any suspect to your controlled standing, walking ability. That's interesting, uh, balance. Mm -hmm. How can one work on their balance as they get older? Okay, so there are, first of all, I'm biased because I'm a physical therapist, and most physical therapists see a high proportion of people, if we want to talk about age-related, people who are elderly, who have a myriad of problems or just age-related weaknesses, whether they be strength or, um, you know, medications, mm -hmm. but um, more specifically, um, you know, there are things around everyone's environment that contributes to a possible fall. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you speak to those a little bit more? Sure. Sure. So the first thing I would talk, well, we did talk about age, and, and that doesn't mean some of the things I'll talk about do speak to age, but also are very much directed to other age groups, okay? So let's say not in any particular order. Let's take a look at your environment, your house, okay? So, um, you know, do you have steps? Do you have stairs? Do you have an undulating terrain around your house? Um, do you have old 70s shag rugs or do you have throw rugs? Those are things that, you know, you might think I just tripped, but how many times do you catch your foot and you don't lose your balance? So in a person who may be older or a person who may have some other type of injury or illness, that can loom as a real problem. So that's an environmental thing. piece. And a couple of things to add to that. I know I've personally had um, wearing high heels in my house mm -hmm. and the heel gets caught on sure. a rug yeah. and I've tripped and also going up and down stairs with glasses that have been mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, newly adjusted Sure. and it, it, it throws my balance off going upstairs mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and going downstairs too, it can be scary. So that sort of segues into a medical piece of the discussion of falls. Vision, okay, if you wear glasses if you have cataracts, if you have any other visual compromise, almost 30% of a person's balance, maybe even more of that, is in your eyes. Really? Yes, it is. Hmm. Not to get too wonky, but at least 30 to almost 50% of your balance is visual. You know what is horizontal and vertical. Mm -hmm. um, another medical piece of balance is your inner ear. Another 20 plus percent, it varies from person to person, is in your inner ear. So if someone has a hearing deficit, something maybe like if you hear the term Meniere's disease, mm -hmm. that directly affects your balance. Any kind of infection, ear infection, anything to do with eyes or ears really are 75 plus percent of your balance system. It's interesting because I don't know no. if we necessarily think about that. I don't think so. Um, and the other small percentage is down, believe it or not, in your ankles the ability for your ankles to know their relation in space. Are you leaning forward? Are you leaning to the side? Mm -hmm. And so those are major pieces to balance. And the other thing too is we talk about um, the systems of the body and let's go maybe into medications. Mm -hmm. um, but before I state, yeah, medications specifically, if you're taking three or more medications, you are significantly at a fall risk. Wow, that's Significant. interesting to know. And not to get too, you know, percentage or detailed, but um, there is a known statistic. 
60 plus percent of the people over the age of 60 will fall this year, mm -hmm. next year, the year after. And so there are, there are, there are statistics that show, you know, that, that these, these, these concerns and these issues with the person. Right. So we talked about environment, talked about medical. Um, you know, anybody, let's talk about some functional, some, um, some strength issues, okay? Anybody who has had, and I won't even talk about a stroke or, you know, a person that maybe has had some cardiac problems. Maybe you've had a knee replacement. Maybe you've just had an arthroscopy. You're a young person and you need a meniscectomy and you get operated on. Anytime there is an operation anywhere near a joint, and I'm back to where that little balances in the ankles. In your knee, you have joint receptors. They tell you the position of your knee at all times. Cortisone injection, medication, a surgical procedure will compromise that position sense that every joint has. So if you've had surgery, if you've had an, just an injury, those systems are all going to be compromised. So you have to keep, you know, you have to keep in mind that um, if you've had any kind of an injury or surgery, you're at risk. So even if you have cortisone mm -hmm. to help alleviate pain, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that still doesn't necessarily position in your knee well. So that so you need to be aware of that. I guess is what so I'm saying when you're walking. So without getting too physical therapist, um, we all when we have an injury and pain, walk in some kind of a splinting fashion. Mm -hmm. we, either, we either protect a certain joint that hurts and we ask other joints to substitute compensate. in and compensate. And they don't do that well. And so if you have a balance system that says, for instance, my hip, knee, and ankle know exactly where I am in space. And now I take my knee because it hurts it's been hurting with or without a cortisone and I'm walking with a slightly bent knee I have thrown off my hip and my ankle mm -hmm. I'm I'm right off without even walking I'm off balance yes. yeah so the other things besides surgery illness I mean if you have an illness I mean we talked about the inner ear or your ear I mean if you have a head cold or a cold and your sinuses in your ears are plugged up because they're all medically related mm -hmm. you're at risk so there are, there are things that we take for granted that, um, you know, present themselves in a real sneaky way that So realistically, what would you see as ways of minimalizing your fall risk? So the first thing I would do is let's go back to the environmental, okay? It stands to reason you put salt or sand down if there's a slippery surface, but you have to know even, it, and a lot of times you take for granted, I know my steps, I know my stairs. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have any of those other issues, the visual, the hearing, the illness, the surgery, any of those things, the medications, you can't take it for granted. I don't even talk about assistive devices, canes. If you have a cane, if you have a walker, you have to be very mindful of every surface you're walking on. Mm -hmm. Because one real fall, and I use that term lightly, one real fall and, you know, you could be wheelchair, Chair. you could be um, unable to mobilize. So. You know, it gets it, it can be very serious. What about rubber grips on the ends of canes and walkers? So things that you can do. Okay, so yes, um, you have to make certain that if you've got a cane or a walker they've been using for some time, that you know you haven't lost the rubber. You can right. be down on metal. I've seen that before, or mm -hmm. wood that does not grip a surface. Footwear we talked somewhat above the floppy footwear, the high heels, all these things that a high heel takes your ankle, puts it at a different position, mm -hmm. there goes your balance. Right. You know, we've all seen someone who was going to a special event, be it a confirmation or the nutcracker, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden they're on high heels for the first time. Watch them walk. Right. <laughs> they're at risk. <laughs> Absolutely. And they are definitely at risk. Yeah. So, and one other thing is um, just being sedentary and inactive, you know, and that and translates into weakness like a surgery or an injury, does the same thing. Can you speak to how to get up when you're a senior? Uh, I know there's people can have issues with their blood pressure um, and getting okay. up, so they're less likely to fall. Um, if you're talking sit to stand, mm -hmm. okay, um, you would always make certain you're using your upper extremities, your two hands to help you, okay? So the more contact you have with that firm surface is going to give you the better we call it transfer in the physical therapy world. 
Vaping, particularly among teens, is a national health concern. Marissa Vital, director of the Southeast Tobacco-Free Community Partnership, discusses what it is, the products used, and its health implications and prevention. E-cigarettes and vapes are one and the same. Um, an e-cigarette is sometimes called an e-cigarette, but it's sometimes called a vape or a vape pen or a mod or even by a brand name such as Juul or Blue. And the devices themselves, while they have many different names, they also come in many different varieties, lots of brands, lots of shapes and sizes. There are two main ways that we sort of classify these devices or equipment, as you said. So there are rechargeable devices and disposable devices. The disposable devices are smaller, uh, basically one-time use. Once the battery is dead and the nicotine is gone, you toss it. Um, and then there are the rechargeable devices. The rechargeable devices are more expensive and you use them multiple times, of course. And within that category of rechargeable devices, there are, again, more categories. Um, there are pod-based devices, such as the Juul, and then there are open systems. Um, so I'll start with the open systems. This is an e-cigarette, um, and the nicotine, the flavored liquid nicotine, would go into this area of the device. The user of the device would pour that nicotine in themselves. Um, there's a battery, there's an on button, and there's a mouthpiece. Um, and the liquid that would go into this device um, would look something like this. So this is just one of over 8,000 different flavors of the oh. liquid nicotine, um, one example. Um, and as you can see with the packaging, and you can probably imagine what it smells like, um, this is a candy flavor. Um, it's, it's really sweet, um, and that's an intentional tactic um, that the industry uses that we can talk about a little bit later. Um, but just so you have an example of the liquid that you would pour in. Um, and then with the pod-based systems, one really popular pod-based system um, that I'm sure you've heard of is Juul. This is the Juul. Um, the device is really small. Um, you can see it fits right into a hand, basically. And the pods go right into the top of the device, like this. Um, the pods are sold in packs of four. And this is the box. And we're looking at J-U-U-L. Right, Juul, J-U-U-L. And Juul is just one brand of many pod-based systems, um, but it's, a, it's an important example because it's really, really popular among middle school, high school, college-aged youth. Um, so this bottom piece right here is also the charger, um, and this is, this is the whole device. Now, um, the pods, like I said, they come in packs of four, um, and one of these pods um, has about as much nicotine as an entire pack of cigarettes, so a real lot of nicotine. And How long could it take you? conceivably right to, so to smoke that so that. anecdotally what I've heard from high schoolers themselves is that their friends can go through one pod in about an hour an hour to a day um, is what I hear from young people is about the average rate of use okay and again that's comparable to a package of cigarettes the nicotine content yeah yeah right one pod is as much nicotine as a pack of cigarettes Wow. yes um, so Within that category of the pod-based systems, there are other devices. The Juul isn't the only example. Um, it's the only one I have right here, but there are other brands, other varieties, and they come in other shapes and sizes too. Um, and for sort of pictures of that and more information about that, um, that website getoutrage.org um, does have that information and it has some really good pictures that folks could take a look at to sort of become familiar with what these devices look like and and you know what what the equipment is okay and yeah. we'll have that put on the screen too yeah so people can refer Perfect. to that right get outrage dot dot org dot org yep. okay uh, the charging is this the only place they can charge uh, this device? Yeah. yeah, so the Juul comes with its own charger. The rechargeable devices, they come with their own charger. So okay. this is specific to the Juul, and this is just a USB charger. So it can plug okay. into um, the side of a laptop um, and just charge right there. And it does look, you know, it looks like a tech device. It mm -hmm. looks like a flash drive. Right. Um, it's small, it's sleek. And for someone, for a parent or a teacher who doesn't really know what they're looking for in terms of an e-cigarette, um, this can be really unrecognizable because of that reason. Right. Yeah. And uh, easy for teens to get away with using in a classroom, conceivably. Right, right, exactly. Well, yeah. it's easy to get it into the classroom because 
Marissa said it looks like a um, you know a part of your computer. If you, right. Um, you know, or carrying it into class, you could be just you know as casual as can be, and you've got it um, you know in your schools, and then you've got it in your um, you know the bathrooms, and you know all the right. places mm -hmm. that you know used to be taken up by smoking or giving way to vaping. Vaping. And, um, the federal government also said interestingly that. Um, over the next uh, two years, and this was two years ago, that uh, vaping was going to become bigger than cigarette smoking, and they must have known something that we didn't know because it, it's become just that. I think you'll um, you'll agree at, at this yeah, point. Yeah. So, so in terms of Massachusetts high schoolers, um, they're not smoking traditional combustible cigarettes at high rates at all. Um, I think it's just about under seven percent of Massachusetts high schoolers smoke regular combustible cigarettes, while about 20% use vapes or e-cigarettes. Um, and that's really an intentional trend. We can trace that trend to the development of these products as a new way to deliver nicotine to young people um, because young people weren't using, e uh, I'm sorry, weren't using regular cigarettes, not using combustibles. So the industry, in response, has developed these new products. They're using the same marketing tactics to target kids. Well, 50 years ago, it was give away the cigarettes, you know, in a small package, you know, outside of the high school and sure. in the college uh, ranks. And uh, they've just come to market to the same crowd in a different way 50 years later. Right. They, the, so the, the three tactics, basically, that they're using now with these, these new products, um, are the, they make the product sweet, cheap, and easy to get. So the sweet flavors, like we saw with the candy flavor, that's just one of thousands of candy, cookie, all sorts of sweet flavors. Um, and the products themselves are relatively affordable, and they're easy to get. If you walk into a gas station or a corner store, you'll see these products, making them really accessible to young people. Okay. Uh, what are the implications on some of these businesses that are selling this to minors? Well, they're taking the same penalty, or in some cases, if there's a local um, ordinance tag to it, uh, they could lose their license to operate, uh, you know, in the extreme. Uh, they'll first be warned and then fined, and then, um, you know, they're obviously not getting it if they're up to their third time. Right. That you would see their license disappear for the most part, I would have to believe. And I mean, I guess it wouldn't surprise me if these younger teens aren't getting adults uh, to buy this for them. I mean, how if if they can't go get it on their own, um, how so, are they getting it? Yeah, so a variety of ways. Um, unfortunately, illegal sales do happen everywhere um, from t from time to time, um, and these products are also or they have been really easy to get online. Um, really, with a, a gift card, a prepaid gift card. So you don't need to borrow mom or dad's credit card. Um, it makes it easy for a young person to purchase this online without a parent knowing. Um, and age verification historically has not been very strict. It's sort of been pretty easy to just check a box and say, yes, I am 18 or yes, I am 21. Um, so that's a big problem too. And then of course, 18 year olds who are in high school, who do know younger kids, um, we can reasonably assume that they are sometimes buying these products for their younger peers, um, and, and that does happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow, I didn't realize they could get it online. Yeah. That's amazing. Wow. Um, well, then we get into, well, why? What's the big deal? You know, what are the implications of ingesting this nicotine in vaping nicotine yeah so we'll start with nicotine um, the flavored liquid nicotine is um, the same nicotine that you would get in a cigarette um, the nicotine use before the brain is fully developed can lead to mood disorders such as anxiety and depression it can permanently lower impulse control um, it can permanently change the way that the brain can learn it actually changes the way that synapses are formed um, which damages the parts of the brain that control attention and learning. And addiction to nicotine at younger ages, before the brain is fully developed, can actually make it harder to quit nicotine later in life. So the earlier you start, the harder it is to quit. 
and nicotine use can prime the brain for addiction to other substances down the road. So nicotine is really serious and it's very addictive. Besides the nicotine in here, there are other harmful chemicals. There's diacetyl, which is linked to popcorn lung, which is a lung disease. There's propylene glycol, there's glycerin, there are ultrafine particles, there are heavy metals from the batteries of these devices, so nickel, lead, and tin. And all of that is heated by these devices. It's turned into an aerosol, actually, not a vapor. So that aerosol, with all of these harmful particles and chemicals that we talked about, that's inhaled into the lungs. And those ultrafine particles, they can become lodged deeply into the lungs. And then the aerosol is exhaled. So the exhale, the secondhand aerosol, is also not safe. So it's not just the person uh, using the device, it's mm -hmm. the people next to them too. That secondhand vapor or aerosol isn't safe either. Hey, I did not realize that. What about, can you tell if someone is vaping? I mean, can you smell it in the air? It depends, it's, it's tricky. With a regular combustible cigarette, you would know right away if someone nearby was smoking. And right. with the e-cigarettes, because the flavors are sweet and fruity, if you don't see it happen, you might think someone's putting on lotion or body spray or eating something. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is harder, it's harder to know. It's important for parents and teachers and, and people who work with kids to really take a second look at an unrecognized sweet fruity smell or any unrecognized tech devices mm -hmm. that someone might see. Take a second look at that and, and investigate it a little bit if you don't recognize it because it may be a vaping device. Well, and it's one thing exposing yourself, but if you're exposing the people around you to these, to these elements. That's why the towns, a lot of them have gone to including uh, e-cigarettes and uh, vaping instruments okay, as, well, part of their, as part of their you know, smoking policies. Uh, that would include, uh, in Massachusetts anyway, you know, high school football fields and you know, um, the school buildings themselves, the cafeterias and so forth. They're all non-smoking uh, without question, and um, that would mean no vaping as well. Okay, okay. That's interesting because I was thinking that vaping uh, businesses were more just for the social part of everything, but if it's to also maintain or contain the, the vapors, that, that makes sense, the aerosol. As you said, that makes sense too. Right, the aerosol. And actually, at the end of 2018, the Massachusetts state law that went into effect did include vaping in the smoke-free workplace law. So as Arthur said, anywhere that you can't smoke, you now cannot I vape. Vape as well. Yeah. Okay. So summing this all up, what do you think parents should be made aware of? Yeah, so parents really, number one, they need to know that vaping is not harmless. It's not just water vapor, although that is a really common misperception out there. Um, it's not water vapor, it's harmful. Nicotine is an addictive substance and there are other harmful chemicals in these devices. Um, parents need to know that talking to their kids is really important. Know the facts, do the research, um, access the information that's available as a parent, and then talk to your kids. Um, let them know that it's not safe, it's not harmless, and you care about their health. You, you want to have these conversations and empower them with the information that um, you know, they're being intentionally targeted by the tobacco industry. It's not an accident that these products are cheap, sweet, and easy to get. They're, they're potential customers for an industry, um, and, and give your kids that information. Maria Vasquez, a Dr. Lee prepared nurse, discusses her experience as an organ donor after having given a kidney to her husband. Well, as far as the selection process, um, once you've made that decision, you'll basically be going through a number of different diagnostic tests to make sure that you're well enough, healthy enough to donate. Um, they don't want to put you at risk for mm -hmm. something that they can find during that time. Sure. Um, so sure enough, you'll go through diagnostic testing. It'll probably take several months before you can get cleared as a donor. Really? Several months? Several months. Wow. Yeah. So this is something you have to anticipate. Anticipate, right. Yeah. It's not anything um, that's short term. In fact, 
when we had our surgeries, it was two years after um, he had been diagnosed. Wow. Okay. I, I did not realize that. And not so much because of the diagnostic testing. I had been cleared early on, but um, we had to wait till his illness progressed to end stage renal disease where he would have been going on dialysis if the donation had not come through. Oh, okay. Um, what did you have to consider as a donor in um, making the decision? Well, as I started to mention, the, the most important thing is to really do a little soul searching and think about, um, you know, can you give it away unconditionally and not have any strings attached, okay? The other thing is you need to be able to understand that in, there is no guarantee that it's going to work. Right. There is absolutely no guarantee that it's going to work, even under the best conditions and when the donor and the recipient are well matched. Um, so can you live with that if the donated organ is rejected? Right. Plus, we were talking earlier, and you mentioned, which shocked me, I mean, sometimes the donor will be the one um, who will pass during the experience, and the recipient lives. Exactly, right. Yeah, it really is soul searching and in some ways even facing, you know, your own existential mortality. mortality. Right. Yeah. Um, are you prepared? Uh, are you prepared physically and emotionally? Um, do you have support in going through this process? Yeah, once um, you've decided to be tested as a candidate, then you'll be assigned a living donor advocate through the transplant center. Okay. And basically what their sole role is, is to be your advocate, to help you through the process and to basically um, listen to your concerns and address those concerns. So you're not really going through it alone. Okay. Um, however, you do want to make sure that you do have a good support system that'll help you. Oh, absolutely. Because even though from a physical standpoint, most donors are in good physical shape and chances are that um, they'll continue to be that way. Um, it's really the emotional and the psychological um, act of giving a part of yourself, even when it's for a great cause, sure. um, that can be a very impactful. Absolutely. Um, can you tell us then a little bit about the surgery and the recuperative process that you go through after you've had it? Well, there are basically two types of surgery to have um, a kidney donation. It could either be done laparoscopically, which entails a few small incisions in your abdomen. Here I am showing you. Here it is. <laughs> um, a few small incisions in your abdomen or the old-fashioned way, as um, sometimes it's called, the iconic flank incision, which is you know quite extensive. And depending on the type of surgery that you have, then certainly, understandably, the longer it may take to recuperate. Right. Um, I was in the hospital, I had the laparoscopic procedure, and I was in the hospital for about three days total. Um, and the average is about two days uh, for most donors. And basically during that time, you're given fluids and pain medicine if you need it, um, nausea medicine, those things that happen unfortunately after surgery. Right. Um, they get you up and moving and that's really the most important thing that you want right. to do. Cameron Dwyer and his mother Marty Dwyer discuss the impact of his marijuana use on their family and how as a family they work to help him overcome his addiction. Well it's definitely been um, you know a long journey like you said. Um, you know, I started off with um, actually hating it, so it's a little ironic that uh, everything <laughs> kind of happened like it did. But um, so I started off in freshman year. Um, I had, like I said, I had always hated it, but um, you know, I started to increase with a lot of mental illnesses, um, you know, like depression, anxiety, um, and it all kind of built up inside. And you know, at some points, I just couldn't handle it. Um, you know, all of my coping mechanisms before that I tried using just weren't working. Um, 
and you know a few of my friends had said you know um you know like let's go smoke or something and uh you know i believed you know what like what's the worst that can happen um uh, you know not knowing <laughs> what the worst was but um so yeah i decided to head out with them and um uh, you know i really enjoyed it i mean if i'm gonna be honest you know that's uh you know that's how you kind of get addicted is you know you really enjoyed it um and so you know what i just kept going on with was the feeling um and you know the blank mind that I got because uh, like I had said earlier um, to you about was how my mind was kind of like a pinball game um, where every every thought was just bouncing off the walls um, and so when I had a blank mind that was exactly what I was looking for just you know a, a time to where I can just stop thinking and just relax um, and so what I kept on with that I kept going from every other weekend to every weekend to every day basically um, you know I never thought I'd do it in school but dumb enough I was doing it in school um, and I, I like I never thought it would have come to that uh, but things apparently for me just kept getting more stressful and I felt like I needed more and more and more um, so I just kept going with that and uh, I ended up getting suspended um, from school for um, a few days because um, I got caught during class um, and which when I look back now is uh, really insane to me I never would have thought that it would have come down to me doing it in a classroom um, which is really sad too. So, um, but that had happened, and uh, you know, my parents had brought up rehab before, um, and so I had felt like maybe that was the best option for me. Um, so I said willingly, you know what, I'll go to rehab, um, and we'll see what happens from there. So, the next couple of days, my parents set a uh, day for me to fly out to uh, California to go to a rehab out there, um, and it couldn't have gone any better. Um, to be honest with you, it was a month and a half of um, just having a set schedule of hanging out with around 10 to 16 guys um, and going to AA meetings, NA meetings, um, you know, getting uh, breakfast, lunch, dinner, um, basically just a regular day without drugs or nicotine, alcohol, whatever it is. And um, so I just Lots of therapy. Yeah, a lot of therapy as well. Um, and it just continued on for um, the month and a half, um, you know, it was definitely um, longer time there. I thought, you know, I thought I'd been there for a few months, but it was only <laughs> 45 days. So, um, but, you know, when I was there, I dug deep into, uh, inside myself to realize what I was doing, like why I was wrong, um, you know, what I really want to happen in my life, what I really am looking forward to doing. Um, you know, with the rest of my life. And what I realized is that marijuana, alcohol, nicotine, like none of it could help me in any way, shape or form to um, achieve those goals. Uh, so when I had gone back, I tried doing the exact same thing that, um, you know, I did while I was out there. Um, you know, I hung out with my family more because I felt really isolated before. Um, I continued to go to AA meetings, met a lot of really nice people there um, and just, continued on the path of sobriety, which is um, now that I know the best way to go down. And uh, so I've been doing a lot better in school. Um, you know, I've been hanging out with a lot more um, people that are like me, um, sobriety wise, so that, uh, you know, it's not as tough as me. I like tough as, um, you know, having to deal with the thought of that on my mind. Um, and mostly just, you know, living my life uh, one day at a time as, uh, you know, I hear a lot and so, um, yeah, that's basically all it is for my story. But for parents, uh, what I'd really tell them was, um, you know, look for the isolation, um, look for the um, deceivingness that, um, you know, you start to see if you see money missing out of your wallet, you know, just, uh, it, you know, don't obviously point fingers. But if it continues, you might get a little worried um, that it could be, you know, the cause of um, an addiction. Um, definitely hanging out with um, some people that you might not think are the best influences. Um, and just, I mean, for a physical state, definitely, um, you know, less active. Um, I mean, you talked about being bored, feeling bored. Oh, yeah. Uh, boredom is the worst part for that, I'd say. Um, it's probably the feeling of not knowing what to do, just in a um, space of mind where you know you have no idea what to do um, and that gives you time to think um, which was the worst thing for me um, experimenting um, whether it be with alcohol or marijuana or anything like that uh, you know it's definitely the worst thing so what I'd continue to do is try to find um, activities for your child or 
um, even for yourself, um, to do so that you don't have as much time um, to spare with um, nothing else to do because that will you know, continue to come up in your mind as you um, start seeing it be more sociable and um, like more acceptable in the um, modern days by teenagers. So uh, definitely try and find something that will keep yourself away from um, kind of that whole acceptable drug usage kind of thing. It's truly the depression anxiety that drives this kind of behavior because you end up, you know, self-medicating. And so we, we put them on a medicine initially that did not work. In fact, it went the other way. And so, so finding the right medicine is really crucial. While Cameron was out in California, he got a blood test that basically showed what drugs might be better for him personalized. I'm like, thank you. Yeah. So anyway, now that he's gone, he's on a couple of meds and he's doing really, really great. Um, but what I noticed is that it, it all started happening at once in my, in my head, deceiving, lying to me, lying to us, I should say. Um, bad, you know, poor grades. He's a very smart boy. And, and so at that point we were like, well, you know, if, if we notice anything or find anything. So I would tell parents, sweep their rooms, um, get them tested if you suspect it. And one parent said to me, well, I don't want to invade their privacy. And I said, well, you're saving their life potentially. So there, be brave. Be brave is one of my messages. Be brave, be strong. And even though we thought we were doing all the right things, taking away his phone, taking away his Xbox or whatever, and that didn't work. And nothing worked. And then we tried the carrot. Well, Yale wanted you to go to a leadership, oh, and nothing, that didn't work. So we're at the point where we're going to therapy every week. We're, we're, and then finally I said to the therapist, we need to go to the, the psychiatrist for medication because this isn't working. And the psychiatrist said he's addicted to pot. And we had no idea it was an addiction. So long story short, um, he went back with his same friends and got into the same trouble again. He was clean for seven weeks, I believe. Um, and then make sure you also understand that it's his, their urine that they're, you're testing, just because, you know, people can be very smart and tricky. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, I mean, and, and so, yeah, that's okay. Um, so, so, you know, what you're trying to do is protect your child. You know, it's not like they're an adult and they can do whatever they want because they can. You know, if it gets to the point of addiction, it gets to the point of them self-medicating, you've got to take charge. You, and, and we didn't know rehab. I mean, I didn't know where we would send him. I had no idea, but through friends of friends of friends of friends, we found this wonderful place that was for teenage boys only. And I have recently given out that name, and another um, boy has gone there. So I'm so grateful and thankful and, you know, and hope that all these kids kind of get back on track and understand how important it is to live your full life and to be happy. And, and yeah, we went through a lot of hell, but... Having him on this side of it for now, what, almost nine months is awesome. We have our son back, and I couldn't be happier. Moms Demand Action Against Gun Violence is a national program with several chapters in Massachusetts. Kathleen Berry, coordinator for the Southern Region of Massachusetts, and Detective Mike Sclavera, a firearms instructor with the Kingston Police Department, discuss being a responsible gun owner, preventing children from accessing firearms, and the implications of improper gun storage upon children and society. Uh, launched the Be Smart program in 2015. I want to ask you and your audience, did you know that in the US, we have the largest reported rate of child unintentional death, gun death and injury in the world? And did you also know that every year 1,500 American children ages 17 and under have their lives cut short by gun violence, of which 100 of those roughly are unintentional shootings and 600 are teen gun suicides? Wow, impressive so numbers. with this program, uh, we are gearing it to all parents and really all adults who are concerned about kids' guns and safety. It seeks to prevent tragedies from occurring when unsupervised children and teens gain access to unsecured weapons. Okay. And the SMART acronym helps people in an easy way to remember five 
simple but responsible behaviors. And I know we're going to go through each one, but yes. what are the what what do the S M A R T? What does it stand for? S is secure your guns in your homes and vehicles. M mm -hmm. is model responsible behavior. A is ask about storage of guns in other people's homes. R is recognize the role of guns in suicide. And T is to tell your peers, spread the word. If you're going to own a firearm, uh, you have to be pro properly licensed. There's LTCs and FIDs. LTC is a license to carry, uh, which typically is your sidearm type uh, you know, firearms, your pistols, uh, revolvers. Uh, it also allows you to own rifles and shotguns. FID basically is essentially rifles and shotguns, more or less used for hunting. Uh, but for in the home and in the vehicle, the storage requirements are the same. Regardless of if you have an FID or an LTC, uh, their storage requirements are the same. So you need to have one of those to, to possess the gun to begin with, right? And then in the home, if you're, uh, whether there's other people that live in your home or not, it needs to be properly secured. So whether it's with a trigger lock system, locking the access to the trigger, whether it's in a safe, uh, in a locked cabinet, the weapon needs to be secured in your home if it's not currently on your person in what we call your direct control. So if you're not currently using the weapon in some way, holding it, you know, having it on your side, if it's not currently in your direct control, it needs to be properly secured. Uh, in the vehicle, it needs to be both secured and unloaded. Uh, there's that slight discrepancy it's between in the home and in the, in the vehicle. In the home, there's the argument relative to self-defense. Some people would like the ability to have a firearm loaded. But if you do have one loaded and it's not in your direct control, it still needs to be secured from access, not just from children, but from other adults, unlicensed adults, anyone. Uh, if, for one reason or another, uh, a child gets access to your, let's say you're a licensed firearm holder, a child gets access to your firearm, uh, that in and of itself, the child having access to the gun, is evidence on its face that you violated this, the storage laws. Uh, so you could be charged criminally. If a child gets access to it, it's a felony. If an unlicensed adult gets access to it, it's a misdemeanor. Either way, you could face jail time uh, and more likely not face losing your license to carry and losing your firearms. We hope you have enjoyed this information and have found it to be valuable. Our community is fortunate to have many talented, well-informed residents willing to share their expertise with all of us. Thank you for your support of Healthy Kingston. The Kingston Board of Health is looking to further increase its presence in the community through several programs. Not only Healthy Kingston, but the Healthy Kingston Speaker Series, which is a collaborative effort with the Kingston Public Library, and it will be starting in September. We also hope to be continuing our work with the Recreation Department and the Council on Aging. The town website includes the Board of Health section with forms, policies, and Kingston Health Clipboard, which gains you access to all of the PAC TV programs that we've done the past year and information on each one of the programs. We get our topics from you, so please give your suggestions to Arthur Boyle, our health agent. His contact information is located on the town website. Again, Thank you for your support of Healthy Kingston, and we look forward to another informative and interesting year.